All right, let's, uh, why don't we take our seats here and we'll begin the panel here in just a second. All right, let us begin here. Thank Dr. Hayflick once again for his remarkably clear explanation of molecular biology. And as is our custom, we'll begin with uh, asking the members of the panel if they have comments or questions, and then we'll get to the questions from the audience. Who would like to lead off? Dr. Selko. Well, I'm uh, enormously excited and impressed by uh, what uh, Len Hayflick has shared with us, and I think it's uh, as clear and compelling an argument as can be made for the importance of uh, the study of the fundamental mechanisms of aging. Um, and so I, I think that he laid the arguments out very clearly, particularly in, in my area of interest, and that is age-related age disease or disease that occurs more commonly in late life. Uh, and that distinction is very clear to me, and even more clear uh, thanks to uh, his lecture. But I would say this, and that is that I think for all of us in the audience, um, while one can support the importance of basic research on the aging process with statistics such as those that you have described, such as the fact that it, it, cancer, curing cancer would only add 2.9 years, I think the figure was or something along those lines, curing Alzheimer's might only add 19 days. Um, those statistics, um, while valid, uh, don't speak to the point that for the individual who has cancer or the individual who has Alzheimer's, the increase in life expectancy is much greater. So that is a population statistic. And so I would say that while I, I certainly understand those numbers, um, I think the reason that our society has evolved a system for doing a lot of disease-related research relevant to aging is because on an individual basis, and some of those important individuals include members of Congress, the numbers are much more, the numbers are much greater than the population statistics imply. So it's a sort of a comment. Okay. How can you disagree? <laughs> Any help from over on the other side there? Uh, actually, I have a question. I, first of all, I also greatly appreciate the presentation that uh, Dr. Hayflick gave, and I was one of those students in the front row, by the way. I will always be one of those students. I'd like to ask Dr. Hayflick the question that my professor, Bernice Newgarden, asked me many years ago, which got me into this field to begin with. This was back in the late 1970s. Should the government increase its funding of research on the fundamental biological process of aging for the purpose of extending the duration of human life? Well, the short answer is no, especially if the government is involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but Jay, seriously, Jay does ask it. <clears throat> an important question that needs to be answered. And we, he and I have, and others here have kicked this question around for years. And let me put it on the simplest uh, basis that I can think of. Let's argue that, that uh, some of us sitting here did indeed develop a white pill that you take each morning, one, once a day, has absolutely no side effects. And it's capable of doing one of the following, slowing down the rate of aging, stopping the aging process, uh, I was going to say reversing the aging process, but let's exclude that. I think that's more science fiction than science fact. But let's assume that this white pill can do one or both, slow the aging process down or stop it completely. Now you have this pill in front of you with all the guarantees that I made. 
So the question, there are several questions. First of all, when are you going to take it? And second, and usually the answer to that is, well, I want to take it when life satisfaction is at its greatest. Well, the response to that, of course, is you've got to pass through that phase of life when it's greatest in order to understand that it was greatest and then return <laughs> to take your white pill. So you've got a big problem. Um, then you start to think, well, gee whiz, you know, um, if I take this pill and my kids don't, someday I'm going to be as old as my kids. And you can go through this list of bizarre scenarios all you like, and you really can't come up, in my judgment, with a scenario that makes sense, even though I've given you the ultimate opportunity to deal with your aging process. One of the things that I think people forget, and I'm going to remind you, is that in this country, we have, and perhaps some of them are in this audience, what we call gerontological cowboys and cowgirls. <clears throat> they're retired, they're septuagenarians, they're octogenarians, they've invested in an RV, their kids are all married, they have no responsibilities for children, and they spend the, uh, the summers in Canada and the winters in Florida, and if you ask them whether they should have taken the pill when they were 40 years old and struggling with raising kids and trying to uh, meet their monthly budget requirements, they would think you're crazy. They're, they will tell you that this is the happiest time of their life, despite the fact that they may have uh, some uh, minor, in most cases, minor medical problems. Everybody who grows old is not sick. And you may be denying yourself the best part of your life. Well, I could go on and on, but I won't on this particular issue. But Jay does raise an important issue. Dr. Whitehouse? Let's go to the audience. OK. And the first one is, uh, tell us about these alligators that don't age very fast. Well, I've never met one, but. <laughs> Um, it's a very interesting story. And again, to give you some idea of the Stone Age uh, level of our understanding in this field, it's only been within the past year or two or three, to be liberal, that uh, we are beginning to pay attention to this, to this observation that's been known for decades, if not centuries. And that is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the class of animals that do not reach a fixed size in adulthood, and I named a few earlier. Uh, there are, the best example are deep sea cold water fish. Some of you have eaten a fish called Chilean sea bass. You would not have eaten it if its real name had been disclosed to you before the restaurateurs changed its name. It was called the Patagonian toothfish. And because there are no laws or rules about what a restaurant owner or a grocery store owner can name a fish, you can name it whatever you want. Now that we have developed a taste for that animal, it's been discovered about two or three years ago that this fish is a member of the deep, a deep sea cold water fish whose aging process is negligible. A dinner size portion of Chilean sea bass is about 100 years old and we don't know anything about its biology and it's a threatened species. Fortunately in my, I'm going to use the term progressive city of San Francisco, the restaurateurs do not sell this fish and of course this is voluntary, you can't demand that people do this. But I make this point to illustrate the level of our ignorance. Apparently the rate of aging varies so that you have extremely low rates of the, of the uh, occurrence of age changes in the animals that I've described. And then you, you also have some intermediate rates of aging and then you have rapid aging, if you want to call it rapid aging, in mammals in particular. The, the other serious problem that I should mention before I shut up 
is that we have no what are called biomarkers for aging that everyone agrees are acceptable. And by that I mean, how do you measure the age of an animal? You, you can't measure its length in most cases. Sometimes you can, it's very crude. We don't have, even for humans, we do not have biomarkers for aging. I can't walk up to someone in this audience and say with a very much confidence that I know their age plus or minus two or three years because you have no markers. It's guesswork. And we need biomarkers to measure quantitatively the rate of aging in animals. And we don't have it because it hasn't been studied. Okay. The question is that the pre-conference material quoted you as saying that cancer cells are immortal. Could you please elaborate? Hmm. That's like asking me, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> um, well, cancer cells have evolved a mechanism for immortality that we think only within the past 10 or 15 years we understand a little bit. Prior to that, we didn't understand it at all. But unlike normal human diploid cells that were described during the introduction that do have a finite capacity to replicate, as do all normal cells, human or otherwise, cancer cells, and this was pointed out in my original paper in 1961, that cancer cells, unlike normal cells, are immortal. At the time, we didn't know why. Now we think we know why, and let me be as brief as I can. Um, the the uh, reason for this goes back about 15 years, when it was discovered that the tips of chromosomes, I illustrated a chromosome, at least on one slide, it looks like a big X, at least for most human chromosomes. At the tips of those chromosomes, it was determined that there is an entity called a telomere. It's the, t the, the function of that end tip of the chromosome was unknown until about 10 or 15 years ago. A Russian biologist by the name of Alexei Lovnikov, who was, who, who was interested in this problem of why normal cells only have 50 population doubling capability, human cells, uh, also was intrigued by another puzzle in biology, and that puzzle was that the DNA molecule, the main molecule that contains your genetic information, when it copies itself, as you know it does copy itself, the copy that it makes is shorter than the original. I won't go into the complex biochemistry, but that was a fact. People couldn't understand this because if the DNA becomes shorter and shorter each time it, it, it replicates itself, you're going to lose genes, and we knew that didn't happen. The Russian Alovnikov in an armchair um, speculation that actually was provoked by, a, by his entering a Moscow subway station and suddenly having a profound insight. He thought that the, that the subway tracks looked like DNA, in fact, it does have some resemblance, and that the engine was the engine and the cars were the enzymes that were replicating the railroad tracks or the DNA. And he reasoned that if the engine was incapable of replicating the tracks, but only the, the passenger cars were, then at each time the train stopped at a station, there would be more and more loss of railroad track. And he said, the way you prevent this is to put in additional track, which is, of course is an obvious conclusion. But when it comes to DNA, he argued, we will put, or at least he speculated, that at the ends of chromosomes are nonsense DNA sequences that do not contain genetic information. It's just plain nonsense. But they're, they, they're there to act as a kind of buffer so that every division of the cell, part of this tip is removed. No problem. Has no information. Nobody cares. But when it reaches a particular short length, the cell then stops dividing. And that was his explanation for my laboratory finding. And it turns out the guy was right on target. I won't go into all the details of the experimental results that occurred after that, but it was proven that Lovnikov's speculation was right on target. Furthermore, and this will answer the question, I'm sorry to be so long, but 
you had to know that in order to get the answer. <coughs> the answer to the question in respect to immortality of the cancer cells is that they switch on an enzyme called telomerase, which at each division of the DNA tacks on to the ends of the chromosome the missing pieces that would have otherwise developed. So the cancer cell chromosome stays constant in length. It doesn't decrease at each division. It stays rigid and constant. And that is why that cell is immortal. Sorry, too long. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Uh, Dr. Hayflick stated that aging is not determined by genes. What is the role of environmental factors in aging? Well, I could give a snide answer to that question and say that you can avoid aging by, by killing yourself at the age of 30, but I won't say that. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody has actually demonstrated specifically and without question an effect of the environment on a specific process of aging. That is an ex extrinsic act, uh, an, an ex extrinsic cause, as distinguished from intrinsic causes, that is, causes within your body. I don't think that things like uh, and I'm talking now only about humans. Uh, this statement is not true for other animals, but temperature changes, uh, changes that don't have an effect on pathology, and that's, a, that's key for me to say initially, but only changes that have to do with fundamental aging process. I don't know of any unless somebody on the panel does. So in that regard, what, what about uh, UV radiation in the sun for age spots, which I thought you listed as a function of age rather than a disease. Yes, but I'm not sure that I would accept, I'm, I doubt you would either, uh, age spots as being a particularly good biomarker of aging. And as a quantitative measure of whether uh, UV is affecting the underlying process, I think that would be a rather poor choice to measure. But, but it would be an example of a potential environmental factor oh, yes. that, well, there that are lots associated with changes that Oh, sure. There are lots of those, but they don't threaten life. Right. Okay. Well, here's another one here. Uh, if, if aging is in large part really is due to getting rusty, why shouldn't antioxidants help delay the process? Probably because they don't get to the site of action. There's no evidence that antioxidants even cross the gut in humans. People take a bunch of antioxidants, but I don't know of any evidence that they pass the gut. So if they, if they don't get to the site of action, they ain't going to work. Um, it's also true in animals. I don't know of any, that there are some, some random experiments that show the effect of antioxidants on uh, aging in laboratory animals, but they, it, it has never been nailed down with certainty. Len, I, I guess that depends on what you mean by an antioxidant, because many people would ask you about vitamin E, for example, uh, which does get absorbed, and actually uh, there's some evidence it gets into brain. The evidence that it helps diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, is rather weak and getting a bit weaker, but I mean, there are a whole wide range of antioxidants, sure. I guess you could... Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know of any one that has been demonstrated unequivocally to slow or stop the aging process. Now that I would agree with. It. Would you think it's theoretically possible? Theoretically, anything's possible. <laughs> Another one. How do you think stem cells research will affect longevity possibilities? Hmm. I think its most immediate effect will be on the pocketbooks of the entrepreneurs who invest in, in uh, stem cell biology. But I, if the real question behind that question is parts replacement, uh, then I think we can only go so far. Jay and I were talking, have talked about this many times. Um, let's assume that you do have stem cell successes and you can replace whatever you want to replace. I don't care what it is. 
And now you have that capability. Uh, you've got two problems. First of all, if you replace everything, you don't have what you originally had in the beginning. It's not there anymore. If you buy a car and over a 15 or 20 year period you decide to replace all the parts, do you have the car that you had 20 years ago? I don't think so. So that becomes more of a philosophical question. But the one thing that, I, that troubles me in respect to the parts replacement argument is replacing your brain. Um, if you're going to replace my brain with a younger brain, then I've lost my sense of self, and I've lost my memory, and I've lost everything that makes me, me. And likewise, you, you, if you decide to have your... So the exercise becomes pointless. Now some, um, some uh, far-sighted cyber gurus have argued that, well, you can upload the contents of your brain to a mainframe <laughs> and then download it to another, another brain. I don't know whether what I'm about to say is going to upset some people in this audience, but I think I'm going to say it anyhow. <laughs> Ray Kurzweil made that remark, by the way, if any of you know Ray Kurzweil. But my reply to Kurzweil was, I'll be darned if I want to be looking out of my monitor when a drop-dead gorgeous girl walks by. <laughs> And I'm stuck there with a hard drive and a small mouse. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm beginning to wonder, is it all biogerontologists that are obsessed by cars and sex? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> I think this might be a good time to take a break. Here. Thank you very much.